It's January 25th, 1858, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So on this day, the eldest child of Queen Victoria got married. She was the Princess Royal Victoria. The Victorians really liked the name Victoria. And the song she chose to accompany her as a recessional to exit the ceremony was the one we still know now as The Wedding March by Felix Mendelssohn. But the composer never got to see his tune become a viral wedding hit because he died 11 years earlier. Yeah, and I think we should just say up top that if, like me, you are not a musical person, it's not Here Comes the Bride. It's the one that goes... At the end. Just, I'm just going to yeah. put it out there, because when I saw the word Wedding March, I was like, which one? Yeah, Here Comes the Bride is actually Wagner, isn't it? Yeah, and Princess Victoria and her fiancé, Prince Frederick of Prussia, actually chose that to be their entrance music, the processional. So they actually kind of founded that tradition both ways they founded the tradition mm. of coming into Wagner and exiting to Mendelssohn mm. well it, it's an important historical footnote that a lesser wedding was the first <laughs> ever to feature the debut of the wedding march this was just the one that kind of made it popular there was a, a wedding between one Dorothy Carew and Tom Daniel in St Peter's Church in Tiverton England on the 2nd of June 1847 a good sort of 11 years as a recessional or as entrance music uh, well that's a good question history doesn't uh, relate that because it is it's a rondo which means basically you can keep repeating it, which is why people now use it for like signing the register. You know, that's like the awkward bit where you have to do the legal formalities after I do and everyone's clapped because you can just keep playing it again and again and again until you're done and it sounds like the same track. Although those two choices of music have become the go-to, the most commonplace choices you could possibly pick for your wedding, apologies if either of you had those at your wedding, it was actually a very personal choice to the couple. I mean, obviously Victoria's family were all of German origin. She was marrying a Prussian prince, so German composers were a very natural choice. And also Mendelssohn had been a really close favourite of Queen Victoria and her family and had played for Mm. them when he came to England until his death. Oh. I can hear Arian warming up for the quote. <laughs> well, um, it's funny you should mention that, Rebecca, because they first met... If Queen Victoria had a view on it, she might say something a little bit like this. And she might have written in her journal of June 1842 that after dinner came Mendelssohn Bartholdi, whose acquaintance I was so anxious to make, and Albert had already seen him the other morning. He is short, dark, and Jewish-looking, <laughs> which I love as her observation of him. He apparently also was delicate with a fine intellectual forehead and they all sat down and she challenged him to do an improvisation where she gave him two tunes did she beatbox for him while he was doing it (laughs) (laughs) almost so she challenged him to put rule britannia and the austrian national anthem together and he did it oh it's like the most intimidating x-factor audition ever isn't it queen victoria on the panel sing me rule britannia can you imagine (laughs) <laughs> well, her final comment of that meeting is, poor Mendelssohn was quite exhausted when he had done playing. And that's the end. That's the last we hear of Mendelssohn in that meeting. Uh, <laughs> so he must have been absolutely like, oh, my God, this queen is asking me to do a sort of original thing with, uh, with tunes that really do not fit together. But he did a good job of it. So well done him. He must have been very proud of that association. Well, he became so familiar with Buckingham Palace that he said later, it's the only really nice, comfortable house in England where one feels completely at home. That's Buckingham Palace. I feel like that. <laughs> After my- Every time I'm there. Yep, whenever I take a little tour of it. (laughs) But even so, he didn't actually write the wedding march for a wedding. He he wrote it as part of a Mm. suite of incidental music inspired by A Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare. It's almost like a 19th century concept album. And then the following year, there was a specially arranged production of the play in Potsdam, Germany. And that was what made me realise, oh yes, it wasn't being played on an organ, because why would it be played on an organ? Why would anyone have wanted to go and see that for accompanying a Shakespeare play? It would have been played by, you know, a standard orchestra in between scenes and at the start and end of the play you'd have had the orchestra playing this lovely incidental music so it had to be arranged for the organ later well that story of it originally being a musical accompaniment to midsummer night's dream is what for some uh, catholic churches at least makes it uh, sort of thought of as a fairly controversial choice because it has this sort of pagan fantastical origin and also i do think the fact that he was from a jewish family I and mean, queen victoria got that right didn't she 
is another reason that some people in the churches wouldn't have liked it. Well, Wagner famously hated Jews and his music is also controversial in the church. So just mm. being Christian isn't enough to get you, get you past the church authorities because Here Comes a Bride, which is <laughs> right. actually called the Bridal Chorus, is from his 1850 opera Lohengrin. And that is also controversial. Both pieces are banned in some dioceses. Most churches now are pretty relaxed on those choices just because, I suppose, because they have become so commonplace. Um, but yeah, there are still churches where you can't have either. And this was such a hit. I think it is worth underlining that this version of A Midsummer Night's Dream by Mendelssohn was like the typical way you performed A Midsummer Night's Dream for about a century, which staggers me because I'm a theatre buff. I love Shakespeare. I've seen A Midsummer Night's Dream like 10 times. Mm. I didn't even know there was a Mendelssohn version. I never even was aware of it. Princess Victoria and Prince Frederick of Prussia got married on this day in the Chapel Royal in St. James's Palace. And it was an incredibly publicised event. It was followed with great interest throughout the country. I mean, although the wedding of Victoria and Albert had, of course, attracted great interest at the time and popularised wearing a white wedding dress, which before then wasn't particularly a tradition. If anything, the wedding of Princess Victoria gained even more attention because Victoria and Albert had created this incredibly vivid portrait of their family in British public life. You know, they'd had a whole bunch of kids. I think I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but like eight, something like eight, I think. And their family goings on were reported in the press and the British public, you know, probably not everyone, but the majority of people felt quite attached to them as a family unit. So the wedding of her firstborn was obviously a gigantic deal in her diary. I won't do the voice. That Queen Thank Victoria God. described <laughs> the vast crowds thronging the route and crowding outside the church. And she called it the second most eventful day in my life. I felt almost as if it were that I was being married again, only more nervous. Yeah, and also her and Albert had created this union. Um, Princess mm. Victoria and uh, Fritz, as he was known in his family, which, by the way, is the inspiration for American troops in the Second World War, calling the Germans Fritz, uh, had first met when he came over for the Great Exhibition of 1851, when he was 22, and she, Princess Victoria, was 10. Yuck! And it was understood then that they would one day be married, and they were engaged when she was 16, but they didn't announce it because they thought it was a little bit indelicate and she was still a little young, um, so they announced it when she was 17. Um, so this had been a long time in the planning, and despite all these details, which you'd expect from a royal wedding, of being very ostentatious and having new things like trained gowns and matching bridesmaids, which were also part of the ceremony, the chapel itself mm. at St James's Palace only seats 100. So it, it wasn't as big a deal in actual fact, as you mm. might expect of a royal wedding when you picture a modern one now in Westminster Abbey. Yeah, but that's because they weren't filling it up with, like, members of Take That and stuff. You know, you only had actual royals there. All the hoi polloi <laughs> were expected to congregate outside. <laughs> Do you want to hear an interesting fact about Packle Bell's canon? You know, it's the one... For the non-musical people, again, it's something that goes... Mm. <laughs> Uh, you know that one? <laughs> so when it goes, I stood. You know what? I started way too early. I shouldn't have started with the introductory noises. You know, it's the one that goes. So that apparently wasn't a wildly popular choice for weddings until after the wedding of Prince Charles and Princess Diana in 1981, and they didn't even have it played what? what they had used was the prince of denmark's march by a baroque composer called jeremiah clark and that in turn sparked a trend for similar baroque pieces to be used in weddings because i suppose not everyone wants to be like we don't want to just take what they used at this incredibly famous wedding that just happened it's a bit you know it's a bit tacky so people started using Packelbert's canon which actually had only been rediscovered in 1919 was not by any means a particularly famous piece of music and definitely not considered especially wedding-y although there's speculation that he maybe wrote it for a wedding it's not funerally is it i think we can all agree on that it's jolly and it's another one that's a bit like the wedding march where you can sort of keep playing it go on and on yeah yeah Yeah. it's a bit of a dirge i mean by the time it sort of goes round and round the third time you're like okay (laughs) i am ready for them to return from that signing of the books (laughs) tomorrow it was britain's biggest exodus since the pilgrim fathers sailed 300 years ago (laughs) it was actually true love the show support the show patreon.com slash retrospectors part of the acast creator network